This is Greg Troutwine with Maritime Reporter TV. Uh, we're here today with Joost Von Rie and Tor Morton Olsen. Joost is with CLIA uh, and Tor Morton Olsen is with Marlink. And we're here to have a discussion about the cruise industry. Um, obviously the coronavirus and COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on many shipping industries. Uh, I, I think arguably uh, the cruise industry more than most. So Juice, just to uh, start things off, um, obviously this situation is fluid. It's changing daily. It's changing rapidly. Uh, I think just yesterday Carnival came out and said they plan to restart operations in August. Uh, I know that Nor uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines also came out and said that they had questions about their viability as an ongoing concern. I don't want you to, to comment on specific companies, but what I want you to do just to start us off is to give us an overview of the industry today as you see it. Well, uh, Greg, hi, uh, good morning to you. Uh, um, thanks, uh, first of all, for having me here. Uh, yeah, it's correct. You know, um, our member cruise lines, they voluntarily uh, suspended uh, worldwide operations uh, a while ago. So the current landscape is a bit different than it was a couple of weeks or even months ago. Um, our CLIA members, they represent 95% of the global uh, cruise, uh, cruise line fleet. And when we are talking about numbers of ships, this means 280 ships and the current situation, and I don't know when people are actually watching this, but it is the 6th of May today. Um, and we, at the moment, we have about 117 ships, so 117 ships in port. They are not operating, obviously. Uh, we got 62 ships at the anchorage, also mm -hmm. not operating, and 95 uh, uh, ships repositioning. Uh, repositioning meaning also not operating, so no guests on board. They're going from one place to another. Sometimes we are also, they also have crew on board. So we reposition, re position crew from one way to the other back home um, for instance to the Philippines uh, as you know airspace got closed airports got closed but we had a, a lot of Filipino Indonesian Indian seafarers and uh, they couldn't go on board planes anymore so what our members done is we made ships available and we sailed them back home mm -hmm. Uh, so those ships are also still on their way and uh, that's an ongoing process still today. I'm based in Rotterdam and today we've got a ship in Rotterdam as well. Uh, Regal Princess is, uh, is uh, bringing thousand Holland America Line Group uh, crew members back home. So uh, that's also part of those uh, 95 ships which are repositioning. Okay, very good. Tor Morton, would you like to, and again, I'll just segue, I'll, I'll edit this out. Would you like to go into the, um, the importance of um, uh, crew communications, or do you want me to stay at, wait until the end? No, we can we can talk a bit about that. Huh? I think um, yeah. Starting off uh, again, uh, Greg, thank you for uh, for organizing uh, this uh, this discussion. Huh? And I think what we see as well, which is very much in line with with what uh, Jost and and, and Clea is, is that uh, any plans that uh, that they had in the past for where to communicate from where for what purpose has changed obviously. So I think uh, what has been really key for us is to be able to be flexible, to, uh, to continue to support crew communications and, and the operational requirements. And at the same time, being able to port bandwidth around so that the vessels in, in use for bringing, for instance, crew back uh, in a safe manner is, is, is fully loaded while the vessels that are in port and at Anchorage uh, can maintain some services to be able to support the crew, which has a higher need for communication back home now than what they used to have in the past with all the uncertainty around the COVID-19 virus. So we see very much the impact of what uh, Jost is describing also on, uh, on communications. Okay. Excellent. So uh, just obviously before, you know, when we were coming out of 2019, um, the cruise market was as hot as any market in shipping. Um, the, the order books were filled. Um, can we just look from the order book perspective? Obviously, there are a lot of ships on order. Uh, do you pick, care to share some insights on where that stands today as far as uh, cancellations or pushing them out a little further into the future? Yeah, yeah, there were uh, a total of uh, around 107 ships on the order book, and I'm happy to say that there still are around 107 ships at the order book. Uh, I speak to the, let's say, the, the three big main yards who build cruise ships. They're all in Europe, 
Um, I speak to them regularly, and uh, so far they haven't got any cancellations, as far as I know. And I spoke to the law uh, to one yard this morning, and they confirmed that too. Uh, so no cancellations yet. However, they are trying to stretch the current order book. So, um, uh, for instance, if they normally deliver uh, three ships per year, they now want to make that a little bit less. And that's in the advantage of the cruise line because they don't necessarily need the capacity at the moment, but it's also in the benefit of the of the shipyard, obviously, because they are limited in capacity, et cetera, as well. Um, it goes without saying that the yards, they have outstanding contacts with their customers with the cruise lines so that's all on mutual agreements and uh, it appears to uh, to work out well so again so far no consolations but we are trying they are trying to uh, to stretch the order book okay awesome uh, may i may i insert an additional question there maybe just a little bit uh, because i'm talking to a couple of them and i'm hearing exactly the same as you say they they are a bit helped as well with the fact that some of the shipyard has been closed for a period so that kind of delays a bit the delivery which i think isn't in line with what they want. But I'm also hearing that perhaps some of the planned refitting of the older ships may not take place. And as a result, some of the more older vessels may eventually be scrapped earlier or be taken out of service earlier than anticipated. So the total capacity in the market may may not be growing as much as anticipated with, um, with the very strong uh, order book. Uh, that, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, I can confirm that. And um, we don't we don't look at because we don't look at it as an industry association at an individual level. Uh, but as in, in the bigger picture, it, it is indeed true that people are looking earlier to, shall we do this refit, yes or no, than to cancel new uh, new, new orders. And maybe, yeah, that the ship can be scrapped, maybe they can, you know, be uh, used for other purposes. Uh, being, for instance, I don't know, you can think about a hundred things, refugee ships, of, I don't know. You know, um, but anyway, um, uh, that will change uh, a bit because of this crisis. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So, you know, obviously, and I don't need to tell you this, Juiced, uh, the cruise industry has impacts far beyond the ships and the shipyards. Uh, the economic impact to the ports, uh, to the merchandisers, uh, to, to the entire web of companies that serve the cruise industry, um, I'm sure is tremendous. Um, do you have a specific number or can you give me a little guidance on the, the cumulative economic impact that you're seeing from this event to date? Yeah, well, unfortunately, the suspension of the cruise operations will have a pronounced uh, economic impact of the global economy. You know, the, the, the cruise industry generates more than 150 billion per year in global uh, economic activity. And we support over 1.70 million jobs worldwide. Uh, and the cruising touches almost every sector. You know, it's transportation, agriculture, hospitality, tourism, manufacturing, and, and way beyond. And even, you know, we, we, we were just talking about shipyards. Can you imagine, you know, the impact a yard has on a certain area in which that yard is located? It's tremendous. So uh, we do know that every 1% decline in cruises results in the loss of about 1,500 1, jobs. Okay. So that's, uh, that, that's quite something. Um, and the, also the value of the global cruise ship industry as measured uh, by extrapolating the share price of the uh, publicly quoted uh, operators, which is you know the most of our members are, mm -hmm. um, has dropped by more than 70%, so 70% in the last two months. And that's equal to a loss in valuation of more than $50 billion. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So Tor Morton, again, I, I'm, I'm going to segue in here if you'd like, but, uh, and if you'd like to wait till the end, you can do this, but uh, Tor Morton, obviously Marlink has uh, a very big presence on the global cruise ship fleet. How has this impacted your side of the business? Well, for us, being a, being a connectivity provider as our, as our main focus, for sure, overnight, basically, uh, every single uh, cruise operator that we're uh, together with as partners, they came back with requests to start reducing bandwidth, changing itineraries, uh, moving stuff around. Um, so for us, it's, uh, it's kind of like the industry almost stopped overnight. I think in average, right now, we are delivering somewhere around one-fifth uh, of what we would do in a normal scenario in terms of internet capacity to um, to the ships, right? Mm -hmm. 
but I think the the uh, the importance for for all of them to keep the crew satisfied fine and uh, and keeping the services running for the purpose of of supporting the crew on board the ships is, is really key. Um, and then I think the big question that we all have is, you know, when, when will passengers start to come on board again and, and, and the service level picking up? But I find that uh, for the most important parameter for them has been flexibility. I think, um, yes, Carnival now says 1st of August uh, for, for start uh, of their seasons with a few vessels in, uh, in um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico area or in the Caribbean, uh, but uh, when will the market really come back? And I think we don't know that, and I for sure uh, think the cruise uh, liners don't know that. So it's all about preparing for, for the rebound and also uh, ensuring a maximum level of flexibility to be able to support either an extended period of the downturn, as we, as we see right now, or hopefully uh, a more rapid uh, return uh, in uh, H2 this year to uh, normal operation. Okay. So that for us has been really key in all our discussions. And then, of course, bringing commercial relief as a result of that. Okay. Yeah, and, and to add to that, uh, uh, please, Greg, um, I can only confirm what Tom Morton just said, uh, and because there is still crew on board of the ships. I was just talking about uh, our members repatriating crew back home. Uh, normally, there's a, sometimes a couple of thousand crew members on board, and the vast majority of those crew members are not needed on board anymore, being hotel operations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However... If the ships are in a port or at the anchorage, they still need a lot of technical crew. So in, depending on the size of the vessel, there are still very often between 300 and 500 crew members still on board. Mm -hmm. So that's way more than an average cargo ship. So three, 500 people. And it's mainly in order to keep on maintaining the systems. Because if you, if you put your ship only with a skeleton crew, let's say 30 people, you know, you don't have the, the, the workforce to keep your systems maintained. And if you want to bring them back into service after a few weeks or maybe even months, we don't know, then you have a real, real problem. Yeah, so still, and the, the crew, which is still on board for them, connectivity is vital because they can't go home. They see and hear everything. They want to be in touch with their family and friends. So it's of utmost important that, that the connectivity is there. Excellent. So just, um, I'm sure when you, when you talk to your membership and your management, um, there are many challenges. There are many challenges just to get through this period and there will be many challenges to restart to normal, whatever that normal is. Uh, can you share with me from, from the perspective of the, of your members, what do you consider to be the top challenges today? Uh, the, to the top challenges, uh, you know, of course, first and foremost priority is always to get the ships, but the passengers and the crew back in ports safe and healthy. Um, we have now come to a stage that we have that operations almost finished. I'm saying almost because as we speak, there's still some recreation going on. That's uh, that's the, the, the most important thing for our members. Uh, and of course, we are working on protocols together with the industry and the various regulators. Uh, but it's quite early to talk about that now because it, that we're in the middle of this. Because until a couple of weeks, maybe even days ago, we were just solely focusing on, on the safety and health of the passengers and the crew on board ships. And mm -hmm. now we start thinking about, you know, what's, going, what's the future going to bring and how can we be prepared and come out even stronger. What CLIA initiatives <clears throat> are being undertaken now? Uh, to help the industry get back to quote unquote normal? Well, we have, we have established certain working groups and those working groups are mainly between CLIA and our members, so designated uh, members of the, the cruise lines uh, who are coming together or not coming together. They have Skype meetings on, on a regular basis uh, to have those discussions. And of course, we have our contacts with the European Union, Union with the CDC, with all the uh, WHO, uh, IMO, you know, all those, you know, the usual suspects, and in this case, some additional, uh, because it's uh, about uh, public health. We are talking to them on a regular basis. When do you expect to see crews come back to a quote unquote normal level? And what will that new normal look like? And then Tor, Mor Tor Morton on, on the back of that, uh, what do you see is going to be some of the technological uh, areas that will be needed to support the uh, the resumption of business? Yeah. Um, well, we will we will not put a timeline on it, um, but we are preparing for the worst, uh, but hoping for much much better. Uh, and, and what will determine that is 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 not it's not really about crews. It's about social gathering. 
right? And societies willing to have people socially gather. And if people are socially gathering, um, that that's a condition which is necessary for cruise because that's what cruise is. So if that happens, then we will cruise. Awesome. And yeah. Tour more. And from, and from my side, I I, uh, I believe uh, Jost is right. I think uh, I think the cruise lines as well until a vaccine is found uh, and and people can document that they have been vaccinated against the virus. I think there will have to uh, the, the cruise liners also will have to um, uh, conform with. Uh, uh, some of the regulatory or the, the advices from um, from public health institutions, from from WHO, uh, social distance, uh, you know, stricter measures in terms of uh, of medical uh, facilities on board, etc. Uh, but I think we as humans are are extremely good at adapting, and I think we see that now. We're all sitting around uh, in video cameras after more or less eight weeks uh, in isolation, right? So. So from what I'm hearing, the, the, the bookings are, are not, is not the problem. It's, it, the, the challenge right now is to find the, uh, what are the measures that the cruise liners need to adhere to before they can start operating again. And then I'm, I'm very sure that we as, as a connectivity and communications provider will, will play an instrumental role in that. The authorities will, will, will have to verify uh, that measures are, are being taken and are being followed. So uh, we will do whatever we can to, to help bring uh, solutions to the market that can help the cruise liners comply with whatever the regulation uh, may be uh, a few months from now. Just it might be a little premature, uh, but what types of new technologies or applications can we expect on cruise ships in the future? Well, it is a good question. It's, of course, a very, you know, it makes sense to ask that question. However, it's, it's, it's hard to predict. If I could predict, I wouldn't have sat here talking to you on this webcam um, uh, because I can't. Um, I also want to say that it's already, that the cruise ships are already, let's say, being on the forefront of adapting new technology uh, in order to make the cruise ship safe, but also to in, uh, increase the, the passenger experience. Um, However, what I see, I think there, it's about, in the future, it's about three things. It's about prevention, uh, uh, detection, and mitigation, right? And ev every kind of system which contributes to those three things will be welcomed, you know, at our cruise ships, at, uh, at our cruise lines to adopt. Uh, prevention, meaning, of course, procedures, but also uh, cleaning, etc. Detection can be uh, pre-boarding uh, screening, uh, remote temperature uh, measuring. So that's going to be quite important, I guess. And I think there will be, I can foresee, and of course it's, you know, it's my personal opinion, but I can foresee that there will be an extra station on board the cruise ships that can be on the bridge, that can be in a separate room, I don't know. What we call, let's say, like a health cockpit, eh? where it's basically a system which integrates all those various systems together and where you can basically have a dashboard of you know, the health situation on board of your cruise ship. And if you see something happening or breaking out or whatever, then you can go to the mitigation process where you might have quarantine areas on board of ships. I don't know. Well, Tor Morton, obviously Marlink uh, and the entire connective, <clears throat> excuse me, the entire connectivity community is an enabler of many of the technologies. And I've read uh, a lot of different uh, projections, not just for the cruise industry, but for maritime in general, about how this situation is going to fast track a lot of digitalization initiatives. When you look at the cruise industry and project on what their needs are gonna be, how do you see this impacting your business? As a communication provider need, needs to, um, to enable that. Uh, that being said, I, I really, believe the, the, the biggest driver for cruise is going to be passenger satisfaction as, as it has been for, for a long time, right? And I think passenger will also uh, require that they are informed themselves on, on the safety and health of, of, the, uh, of the ship and of their, their fellow passengers on board. So I, so I think there is a strong demand for, for uh, continuing the, the already well-developed digitalization process on board a cruise ship in, in, in terms of customer experience. It's just that I believe authorities and, and uh, ports will also want to tap into those data to ensure that uh, the ship is healthy before they let the passenger um, uh, on shore. So uh, cruise is, is very much advanced. If I look at some of the other uh, markets, Greg, I think uh, what we see in Merchant, for instance, is uh, both telemedicine, uh, remote uh, IT, uh, uh, those type of applications uh, are picking up a lot of interest, cyber uh, as, as another one. 
But the biggest challenge for the for the other parts of the market has really been uh, about the crew. You know, how do uh, they take care of the crew? They cannot replace them as often as they normally do, so they're not allowed into port when they get in. So uh, bringing crew facilities uh, up to standard uh, is, is something that is happening these days. We see a lot of upgrade requests, uh, more services required by by, yeah, by the energy market, by, by everybody that is operating a vessel with, the, with stationary crew on board. Uh, fishing, same thing, merchant market, the same thing. And, and I think that change is not gonna revert. I think that's a change in, in, in habits of people that will continue also after um, the end of, the, of this crisis. So if anything, in the other markets, it's gonna drive digitalization even faster. I think people, me included actually, see the benefit of using tools instead of driving in and out of the office every single day. So. Um, I think the same is the situation for many of our clients. So if you could uh, put it into a couple of concise points, uh, what do you think are the steps and procedures that's going to need just to get the cruise public back onto cruise ships once, uh, once, they're, once they're given the green light to go ahead? I think it's, for me, it's too early to answer that question, to be honest. Uh, the, 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 the discussions are, are ongoing. Uh, and again, as I said, we've just been focusing fore and foremost on getting the ships and the crew and the passengers back safe. That was our number one priority. And now we just started to look at the future and, and there are so many discussions going on. I can't just mention one. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I know it's busy times. I know it's bizarre times. I appreciate your insights and I appreciate you joining me here on Maritime Reporter TV. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much, Greg. All right. This is Greg Trawine with Maritime Reporter TV.